Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm here with my brother. Say hello. Hey, how's it going, guys? This is Alex. All right, so this is going to be the top 10 movies of the decade. So this is how we're going to do it. We're both going to give our lists. I'll give my number or I'll give my number 10. Alex will give his number 10 and then we'll break it down 10 to 1 from there. All right, so you go first, Alex. Sure. So um, uh, at my number 10, we just saw this film, um, is uh, Uncut Gems with Adam Sandler. It uh, just came out a little while ago, and that, that's my number 10. Um, that's my number 10, too. Okay, so what yeah, are, well, we can just talk about that to start out. Um, the way they use tension and the way they use just the, the chaos of, of, yeah, of the All movie. the yelling and screaming over each other, yeah. It, it had a very yeah. New York go, go, go feel to it, right? Yeah. And Mr. New York is even in the movie, Mike Francesa. Yeah, 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 no, that was exciting. You probably exciting for you to see him. Um, Kevin Garnett is great in this movie. He had a big for, role, yeah. yeah. He had a pretty big role for, uh, you know, a, a sports player, and he was great. And, and Adam Sandler was fantastic. Yeah, no, he um, finally found his 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 niche as an actor. I think. Yeah, yeah. but I I think the 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 direction is just really why this movie's in there. And who knows, as time goes on, I, this might even be higher on my list. And who the, directed it? The Safety Brothers. I don't, the I don't, Safety don't remember their first names, yeah. but they're the, the Safety Brothers. Yeah, yeah, and they just did a really good job of of creating tension and just kind of claustrophobia through sound. Every everything from a yeah. knock at the door to the cell phone going off to somebody yeah. yelling, everything was. Um, we created tension. Well, really what well did you think about the fact that it took place during the 2012 playoffs? You know, right after Derrick yeah. Rose got hurt. You know, the Celtics kind of had an easy ride to the to the conference finals. Yeah. Well, I see you're a big NBA fan, so I don't have that much of a perspective. I like the NBA, but I, I don't. I didn't. You're not a historian remember. like me, right? No, I'm not. A, <laughs> no, I'm not a pro like a pro historian like you. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I dug. I definitely thought it was it was a, it was a really interesting and unique concept um, involving the NBA like that. I also think it's it probably brought. A lot more people to the theater because the NBA is very popular. Sports yeah, very popular. It, it, so it was, it, that was smart. It, it, to it, it was that really interesting story. that they picked 2012 because I remember Garnett had like a career resurgence. He had a lot of really good games. You know, they pushed LeBron to elimination where LeBron had to dig deep down and get that eye of the tiger. And it, it's funny, like I remember Garnett cut that promo, and you were even like inspired by it. Like, man, Garnett, you know, so much intensity, so much emotion. Yeah. So it's interesting how they chose that time. You know, for Garnett to find like this, this this uh, piece of jewelry from uh, mm. Ethiopia, right? Was it right? Yeah. That that yeah. gave him like these superpowers, because it's kind of like he found the fountain of youth. That at, I think he was thirty six at the time. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but but you know, the story of the movie is Adam Sandler, and you know, uh, how, how would you describe that character? You know, he basically he's a he's a Jewish man that's married, has kids. Sure. But, but then he has uh, you know an affair with a really you know good looking girl as well. He's he's married to this lifestyle of constantly trying to hustle or come out on top of, you know, basically, you know, hustle other people or, you know, get a bigger bang for his buck with every piece of jewelry or jewelry or anything valuable that he has. Yeah. And because he's so married to that, his wife has to be married to it, his kids have to be married to it, his girlfriend has to be married to it. So it's also kind of a it's an interesting story because you you see you know the woman that he really is you know in love with is the woman who works with him right right his mistress yeah. and um, uh oh I don't want to give away too much but um, you know um, you find that out pretty early on now, don't um, worry about giving stuff yeah. away I, you know we're just gonna just roll with it yeah you know people get people get mad sometimes uh, nowadays but, um, but mo most of these no, movies have been around he's, for years he's so. married to this and anybody else is around him is is has to be part of it too you know yeah. which is frustrating and I think a lot of people can relate to that you know with people in their families you know right so but yeah. but but I mean talk about Adam Sandler you know he's he's been kind of you know, stereotyped as more of a Jim Carrey uh, type of actor, or, you know, like the people we yeah. took acting classes with, they probably hate Adam Sandler, right? But. Sure, yeah, I, and he's not thought of as a, as a great actor, but that's because a lot of the work that he does is not, you know, serious. It's, yeah. it doesn't, it's not taken seriously. Yeah. He doesn't even take it seriously. So yeah. More recently, he's done some stuff on Netflix that, you know, it's not very good, you know. He did something with Jennifer Aniston that was 
I watched about the first 15 minutes and it was it was pretty bad. It was comedy. It was it was poorly directed. The characters weren't likable. There was really no reason to keep watching after 15 minutes. It was supposed to be a comedy. You know? Oh, like, really? Yeah. This is not good. So, and I, mean, I haven't seen everything he's seen on, that he's done on Netflix. Maybe some of the stuff he he's done has been good. But um, no, he's put out a lot of crap. You know, so yeah. he needed something like this, and right. this was really good. I mean, you know, um, Daniel Day Lewis apparently called him up and yeah, said no, that yeah. he should yeah. get no, he, nominated for an Oscar. Yeah, we we should watch. I mean, I've seen it already, but the, the the podcast with Garnett Sandler and Bill Simmons, it, it was it was great. I mean, it was a little bit too basketball centric for I think your taste, but um, yeah. but yeah, man. I, I, I mean, I think Adam Sandler. You know, th- this is kind of like Stallone and Creed yeah. for Adam Sandler. I would say. You know, it's kind of like he he's been like true. You know he's true. taken all these criticism for years, but and and he, you know he, I think he proved when he he's in the right yeah. role, in the right director, right movie, right situation. You know he's you know I, he might even be up for an Oscar. I hope. I mean, how fucking crazy would that be if Adam Sandler won an Oscar? I know that'd be insane. <laughs> I don't think they're gonna give it to him, but he's the he's damn good in this, and it's very refreshing filmmaking. Yeah, it's very. And I good. think Garnett has a future yeah. in acting too. Man. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. No, he's he was great. He yeah. was great. Um, all, right, all right, so we'll move on to number nine. My, my number nine, um, and this just kind of made my list, um, it was going to be an honorable mention, but I was like, you know what, i got to put it in there, is The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg and Christian Bale and, um, and Amy Adams, directed by David O. Russell. This came out, I want to say, 2010. So this 2010? Was no, I was looking at the list this yeah, morning. It was 2010. Very beginning of the decade. Melissa Leo won an Oscar for her role in that. Best Supporting Actress? Um, yeah. Oh, wow, wow. And she's amazing. And uh, I fell in love with Amy Adams in this, in this movie. Um, and uh, Christian Bale is amazing. It's just... David O. Russell handles the family melodrama very, very well. He does that incredibly well. And in this, it's kind of like Rocky with a family melodrama that mixes comedy and drama together really well. This is great. So I really enjoyed, and I love Rocky, so I really enjoyed this film. What, what, what type of uh, fighting is it? Boxing or MMA? Box, boxing. boxing. Yeah, it's, it's straight up boxing. Yeah. yeah, straight up boxing. And it's based on a true story of, of Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward, um, um, he, um, his brother, who had knocked down Sugar Ray Leonard, supposedly, yeah. um, after his, his brother was kind of like the uh, claim to fame in Lowell, uh, which is Lowell, Massachusetts. Oh, right. But sh- not long after he had that bout with Sugar Ray and he, he supposedly knocked him down, um, he, uh, he ended up getting addicted to drugs. So wow. Christian Bale plays essentially he plays a crack addict who has the you know this this fame of being a hometown hero because he knocked down Trigger Ray Leonard. Wow, and wow. His brother Mickey Ward is trying to get out of his shadow, yeah. and then Amy Adams they fall and they they kind of fall for each other, and she tries to pull them away from his family, and his family tries to pull him back. So it's a really wonderful story about what your family means. You try to drift apart from them, but but all you try to make it. You have to have your own identity yeah. apart from them. You also have to appreciate them and love them at the same time. So it's a really great story about brothers. Yeah. Really great story about families, and um, and <laughs> the enmeshment of family, the loyalty of family, everything that goes into it. And it's but it's it's good. It's I really I really uh, really recommend. Uh, well, that well, one. yeah. I, I mean, when we look back at this decade, this is the only Mark Wahlberg movie on your list, right? I think so. Yeah, when you look back at not just this decade, but you know, like the last twenty-five years, you know, going back to a movie like Fear, I mean, it's it's amazing what Wahlberg has done. Not not, not really in terms of the acting, but just like the starring roles, the amount of money he's made. I mean, he's yeah. really he's really become. I think I think consistently, mm-hmm. maybe like the the highest paid actor in Hollywood. Yeah, you when, might. when you look at the the span sure. over time, and I respect him because he's. He's taken on some projects that aren't necessarily like this project in particular. You know, was a tough, was very tough. He didn't get nominated. Christian Bale won. Melissa Leo won. They won the Oscars for this. Yeah. He didn't get nominated. Wow. And that's yeah. because his character is more. You know, he, he's less extreme than those other characters. Yeah. But him being involved in this was very important because he's such a name because he he you know he makes money at the box office him being involved and being in that role is really really important and yeah. he he actually went to the gym for months and months 
And I think he trained for a year, not in the beginning, not knowing that this film was going to was going to go. I think oh, okay. even before David O. Russell was signed on. Right. My understanding is he was training for this role, not completely certain that he was going to... He knew he wanted to do a boxing movie. Right, He right. really wanted to do this yeah, one, I and mean, then they the, got it. Yeah, I'm know. thinking of Jake Gyllenhaal in uh, Southpaw. I, I remember, you remember he really went mm. like crazy with it, where he trans yeah. he, he basically became like a fighter sure. in terms of the way he looked. Right. And so, the, so you're saying that Wahlberg really wasn't, because they were uncertain about it, he didn't really train as hard? No, he... Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, he did train as... He did train. Right. He trained for. Well, they just they just weren't sure if they were gonna. He, the movie was a go. They weren't. Uh, we they weren't a hundred percent sure they were gonna get. But he started training because he wanted it so bad. Yeah. And he and he did. He he looks. You know, I'm not a fighter, and I'm. The, but he looks great. He yeah, looks right. great in the movie. Right. Right. Um. You know, I think he even looks less bulky than he normally would. You know, uh, to just play a fighter. But it's funny. Because I see what your number nine is, is another Jake Gyllenhaal movie. I don't have I, yeah, it. Yeah, so I'll go to number I, nine. So I, by the way, I love Jake Gyllenhaal. He's great in that movie, but that movie is not. There's the, That movie is just not, for, for me, doesn't right. flow the way it's supposed to be. Well, it, it, it's weird, great, yeah. It's still damn good. All, right, all right, so at number nine, I have uh, Nightcrawler with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. I've, I've only seen this once. And um, you know, my I think my our dad he he talked to someone um, that works in the business that's a cameraman, and and he thought it was the best movie he had ever seen. So, um, but but th this movie, you know, it really taps into the obsessiveness that uh, I, I guess you would call a journalist or, or or people that are trying to make a name for themselves by telling a story. How how cre how far will they go just to get something um, newsworthy? Or something that will create buzz, and it gets to the point where he actually stages the crime, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the movie, he right? He ends up staging. He, he ends crimes. up staging it. Yeah. Um, so you know that that that's what I remember about the movie the most. Just the uh, how sick and twisted that could be. Yeah. Which is a very. I mean, if people actually do. I mean, people actually are doing this. I think in real life too, uh, especially on the internet, just like staging crimes just so they could get hits on on YouTube or whatever. So. Um, but you know, Jillian Hall was great. You know, I, I he he really kind of uh, when you look at this role and compare it to some of the other stuff he did, you could definitely see, um, kind of the sleaziness come out in him in this movie. I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could definitely you could definitely see that. Mm -hmm. But do you have anything to add about sure, uh, Nightcrawler? Sure. Sure. Well, first off, I do. You know, like I said, it's funny that I think he's one of the greatest actors. One of the greatest actors ever, Jake Jillian Hall. Uh, but I don't always think. That he works with the best director. He works with good directors, but he doesn't work with the best directors. In this case, this movie didn't make my top ten, but it, it would have been an honorable mention for me. I'm glad you have it on your list. The lack of empathy in that character. And I really like the way he uses like some of the business culture language. You know, if, if you watch a lot of these, you know, or you, you read a lot of these books about being positive and being optimistic and selling yourself. That's yeah. you gotta sell yourself. He uses a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, in his just that's just the way he talks. But, but if you talk that way all the time, you don't sound like a regular person. You sound like you're you know, like you're selling something on an infomercial all yeah, the time. And that's yeah. kind of what, what he sounds like. Oh, yeah. And you could just tell he is just, uh, there's no empathy yeah. there in that yeah, character. Yeah, the, the, the character, just, you, you just, yeah, you, you just can't have a, a regular face to face conversation with him without it being about him trying to hustle you in some form or fashion. Yeah, right. yeah, right. It, 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 yeah, no, he, he's, he's just, he, he, there's only one direction for him to go, and that's, and that's up more success with, with what he does. And, 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 it, and it is kind of a sort of a quiet commentary on what's kind of become of, of American uh, news media, right. I, I believe, right. when I watch it. That you, could, you could see that these people are reporting this. Do they really care? You know, right. and and how is it reported, and how they t how are they taking care of it? You could see the difference between, say, one you know you know piece of media, and then if you watch you know I, if you watch something uh, like the BBC or you know a, a, another European media outlet, and how they handle that news, you could yeah. see the difference in the, in the care that's taken and how they report these things. Right. And I think especially coming up through the nineties. 
uh, you saw more and more like havoc being reported you know in, right. in in news in news media so i think that this is more like a quiet commentary through that character of that style of 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 american journalism that has just kind of you know yeah. b- bloomed into um the with television and yeah. multiple news channels you know on your tv screen all right so um uh... Why don't you give us uh, your number uh, eight movie? Number eight. Um, okay. My number eight is uh, Manchester by the Sea with uh, Casey Affleck. Um, honestly, if it wasn't for Casey Affleck, this wouldn't be on my list. It's, it's a slice of life movie. It is a dark family melodrama but you don't know how dark it is until much later in the film uh casey affleck won best actor for this which is really saying something it's very well directed but it's very plainly stated you know it's a very simple movie um you know there are some stretches where there's not too much dialogue um and casey affleck just his his ability to play this character in this incredibly plainly stated, um, quiet way, um, and for him to be able to kind of bring you into the suppression of those feelings, the suppress because what, what you find out that he's suppressing is so deep and so dark, and you know you see him kind of er- erupt when he drinks too much. Um, but the other characters around him, his nephew is great, his his brother is great. The, the performances in this are just so good and you care so much about these people and you think about your own family. And, and this one, it's hard to not put this higher, um, actually. Yeah. But uh, it's just you've got a lot of great movies, you know, you know that, 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 that came out here. And, well, um, yeah, it covers yeah. a lot of ground. So, uh, so, so that's that's my number eight is Man- and that, Manchester that's, and by that's the Ben sea. Affleck's uh, brother, Casey Affleck. That's Ben Affleck's brother, and he's Casey Affleck's done some other great things, yeah. um, like uh, Out of the Furnace. He's really good in that. Oh yeah, he's done so. He was he was all. I didn't see, actually that this one's not on our list, but I didn't see um, Interstellar. I didn't see all of that, you know, because that's 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 going to be on a lot of people's lists. Is in Christopher Nolan's Interstellar. Yeah. Casey Affleck was also in that. The Manchester by the Sea was that nominated for an Oscar? He won the Best Actor. Uh, okay, no, I remember this getting a lot of attention. Yeah, and but it was but it had a lot to do with his performance and the director, you know, allowing him to have that sort of performance. And right. real quick, it it is reminiscent if you've ever seen Five Easy Pieces with Jack Nicholson. Very different story, yeah. you know. But both those movies would that would be a good double feature? Is just because yeah. of the way the films are shot in the way the the like i said that plainly stated way of making a movie where right. it's nothing glamorous it's nothing you know that's supposed to impress you but it's just l- letting you into these people's lives right yeah. okay all right all right so my number eight movie is uh once upon a time in hollywood and i'm surprised you didn't have this on your list because you saw it twice i only saw it once but you know um you know when i first heard about this and we'll keep this short because i think we want to do a full review uh, before you head back, but um, you know, when I first heard about it, I, I thought it was going to be completely about um, Charles Manson and the Manson murders. That, that that that's the only thing you hear about. It's like, oh, Quentin Tarantino breaking news. He's going to do a story based on the Manson murders. But you know, that that really wasn't the full story here. This is more about you know Hollywood back in the late sixties. Um, but, you know, I, I think the movie, it really captures how nostalgic it was at that time for people that grew up in that, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. It was really, you know, the the, the generation before us, they would consider that like the golden era. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was kind of like the, the, you know, Tarantino finally settling down and doing something American for once. <laughs> you know, he kind of got away from the Westerns, kind of got away from the war movies. And it was kind of, uh, it was just a, a nice little return. You know, n- not really a, a current day movie like a Jackie Brown or Pulp Fiction or even Reservoir Dogs. But it was still, you know, it, it, it's it's the most recent he's gotten in uh, in years. So that that was a nice uh, change of pace. But uh, I know you saw the movie twice. I mean, do you... Um, do you want to add anything? Well, yeah, no, it, it was it was fun to kind of have him return to to 
Well, it's not modern day, but it's closer to modern day because he was doing the historical stuff for a long time. Oh, yeah. Technically, it's still historical, yeah. but it's not a Western. Uh, it still has, obviously, Western elements in the movie that they're shooting, but it's not a Western. It's really about the movie business, and it's, about, yeah. and it's really about these two guys played by DiCaprio and Brad Pitt who, you know, are in the movie business. And so it's also kind of a buddy movie in yeah. a way, which makes it a lot of fun. I think that that's one of the reasons why it's not in my top 10 right now is, it, or, you know, maybe won't be in my, you know, my, one of my top five Tarantino films is because it's, it feels, it's a smorgasbord movie to me. There's so much in it yeah. to, that you can, that you can, you can pick up on and take in and it's a lot of fun, but I, there's not like one thing that it, that it centrally focuses on for me to really absorb. Cause that's when I go to the movies, I really want to get absorbed in one or two characters yeah. and really kind of feel what they're going through and, 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 and have that reverberate in my mind. Whereas this one is like, uh, there was another, there was a Coen's Brothers movie that was also made, there would be a good double feature with this called Oh Hail Caesar, which yeah. is also about old Hollywood. I think it takes place a little earlier than Once Upon a Time in, in not Mexico, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, so, um, and that would be a good double feature because they're both kind of like, in, in one way, shape or form, they're both kind of like love letters to old Hollywood and right. um, a lot of fun. I love the Brad Pitt character. I love the Leonardo DiCaprio character. In fact, I think those are two of my favorite Tarantino characters. Yeah. But just the movie as a whole, the way it flows, is just not one of my favorite Tarantino flicks. That's all. That's and that's right. just how I feel about yeah, it right yeah, now. Yeah, maybe the uh, maybe the pacing was a little bit slow at some points for you. Is that, is that it? Sure. I know people that fell asleep to some of the uh, Western scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, so. he brings the pace down there. You yeah. know, he brings it back up. Well, with well, the comedy. well you know, it's a comedy. The way I look right, at it, right, right, right. There's a lot of comedy ele elements to it. I would say Brad yeah. Pitt's more likable in this movie uh, than he's been in years. But, but the, the the final thing I want to mention with this is, um, I just want to get your take on what the director told me. You know, this this guy was he were a premiere of this guy. Um, he he directed this small independent movie, and he made a. He he he. Re we were talking about the movie, and he said that he thought that uh, the girl carried that whole scene with DiCaprio. He he thought DiCaprio was terrible in that scene. He thought the little girl had to carry that whole scene. Um, and the people kind of disagree with him. But um, what what what's your take on that? He's an independent film director. They see things differently, right? They see things differently. Leonardo DiCaprio is also like. He's the master of his own universe now. He's, you know, he's the the new Brando in, in a way. I mean, he 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 ha he can make whatever movie he wants to make, and anytime you're in a position like that, people are always going to criticize you with bias. You know, you're always yeah. going to get criticized with bias when you're on when you're the guy on top, and he is the guy on top, and has been the guy on top, and. Um, I don't I think it's silly to say that, you know, yeah, the girl was really amazing, but I thought the way he played his insecurity was incredible. Like, right. like it, and it and it's it's funny and sad at the same time because you know, a lot of it's very relatable, you yeah. know, when you take on an endeavor like that, yeah. whether it's acting or music or whatever, you know, there's always a, a dose of insecurity that that comes in and he's at the end of his He's sort of at the end of his career, and so he's sort of questioning how much more does he have, how much longer does he have, and this little girl's at the beginning, and he's he's so incredibly insecure, and, yeah. and uh, no, I I really thought he played that that really well. Yeah. You know, he starts sobbing in front of a in front of like an eight year old girl. Come on, that's funny. You know, yeah, that's fun. Not sobbing, but crying. I mean, come on, that's that's funny. So no, I I I don't think that that criticism is. Necessary I, I mean, w that. were you a little bit disappointed with the Manson side of it, though, as far as the lack of storytelling about you know why they're doing this? No, you, you don't really even get to. No, they, I know they show Manson in the yeah. movie, but Manson doesn't end up being one of the people that was involved in the Sharon Tate murder. No, but before we move, because we should move on if you want to do another video on this, but what I will say is that if you, you know, that's not a spoiler that we said, in fact, we're doing you a favor because I have a friend who saw the movie. He didn't even know it had anything to do with Manson. 
you know, because he doesn't watch a lot of movies anymore. And it has very little to do with Charles Manson, very but little. you do want to know that the movie takes place around the time of the Manson murders. Because if right. you don't know that, you might be a little confused. Because right. there are people who went to see this film who had, like, no idea. That, that's becoming a big thing, is people want to go to the movies completely blind. And I think this is one that you should do a little research on. Right, uh, right. You research, like, who was involved in those murders and what happened. Because if you don't know that, I don't think the end of the movie is going to be as valuable to you um, as a viewer. It certainly wasn't to me. Because I knew who Manson was and I knew who Sharon Tate was, but I didn't know what happened, what actually happened. So you kind of want to go in knowing some more about those murders yeah. before you see this film. Be otherwise, it might not have as much of an effect. You still appreciate it, but it's not going to have as much of an effect. That's okay. just, the, you know, so that's what I would All say. All right, what's your number seven? My number seven is uh, Place Beyond the Pines. Um, I didn't know where, I, this had to be in my list somewhere. This, you know, inspired one of my songs, um, this movie. Um, one of the reasons it's, it's seven and it's not like number two is because, you know, it's similar to kind of like Pulp Fiction in a way. Only, you know, because the movie takes place, it's almost like it has three stories. Right, now you're right. The difference being that the stories are more related and more interrelated than a movie like Pulp Fiction. Um, but um, I just, I really, I just really liked the direction of this film. It felt very non-Hollywood to me. Uh, Ryan Gosling is, is, his character in it is great. Um, I love the concept of him being this circus motorcyclist who stops off in a town, realizes that he, he's actually had a baby with a woman played by Eva Mendez, and then he starts robbing banks on his motorcycle to try and become a father because he doesn't know what else to do. He doesn't have any other sort of skills. He doesn't know what else to do. And so there's this mystique around his character I won't tell you exactly what happens to his character in the first act, but basically it's a very ballsy thing to do because he was already becoming like the biggest star in the world. It's a very ballsy thing to do, almost Hitchcock-like. Um, Bradley Cooper's also in it, and he's very good. Not necessarily likable, but that's a very interesting part of his character. Ray Liotta's in it. He plays a bastard. Ray Liotta oh, plays yeah. a bastard in everything nowadays. <laughs> Every time you see him, he's just like the yeah. meanest bastard you've ever seen. He's great at doing that. And um, But it's it's got this very kind of fantasy mystique in it, but it's, but it's a very real movie, and um, it takes place in Schenectady, New York. Oh, and wow. So, That's um, where Pat Riley's from. Yeah. I think it's about Pat Riley. I think, no, it's not about Pat Riley. But uh, no, but, <laughs> but no. So I, uh, yeah, definitely. That's, that's, that's my number seven. If you want to see kind of a unique movie, you know, with interesting direction, yeah. it's a little disjointed. I think the pacing is a little, you know, slow at times. But I think that the character work is really good. And I think that what the film is saying it's just no, I, I actually liked it better than Drive. I, yeah. I, I thought the movie was, uh, you know, very engaging. I, I like the fact that the last part of the movie is kind of like, it's kind of, I don't remember exactly how it ties in, but I do remember uh, it being like a third different, you know, story. Yeah. Um, but what I remember about, you know, the, the, the bank robberies, I, I just remember the first two times he robbed the bank, he got away with it. And the third time they put up like these protection, extra protection of layers so he couldn't rob the bank. Uh -huh. So I thought that was uh, really interesting. Yeah. But, very, uh, but it was a very, 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 very dark movie too. And, and you could see a lot of similarities between this role for Ryan Gosling and the, uh, and the drive movie. Yeah. I, it really, it really does feel kind of like the same character to a degree. That's another good double feature. Yeah. 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 It is a very similar character, but very different, very different feel. Yeah. Okay. All right, so my number seven is uh, Get Out. Um, so, I, I mean, w when you look back at this decade, I, I think one of the things that really resonates with me is that, um, you know, I, I mean, when we grew up as kids, I remember a lot of the black movies like Friday, New Jersey Drive, they, they weren't, they didn't put them in really big movie theaters. And, um, you know, I just always uh, remember that, you know, they, they just didn't get a lot of uh, attention. You know, they, they, they just didn't do very well. 
Uh, but I think one thing you notice about this decade is a lot of the, the movies that are uh, attracting blacks have definitely been successful, made a lot of money. And, uh, you know, Get Out's kind of like the, uh, the, the kind of like a black comedy horror movie. And uh, I just thought with Get Out, um, no, I, I just thought you, you, you had something really, really creative. You know, it, it's just one of those movies where you've never really quite seen anything like it. Um, and, uh, you know, the storyline was just out of this world. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was just one of those movies where, um, it's kind of, it was kind of like modern day. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess you kind of say they, they kind of put it, put a twist on modern day, uh, slavery. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they would, you know, the, the, it's basically about a, um, you know, a college girl just bringing home black guys to a family and, and the family would actually, you know, surgically, you know, surgically repair, uh, you know, whether it be a, a male or a female, surgically repair them and, and, and insert like kind of like a white brain into them and then kind of control them. Uh, you know, just really creative. And I, I just thought a lot of the, the face, especially the black maid, just a lot of creepy facial expressions. Uh, you know, the, the mother with, you know, stirring the cup of tea and, you know, kind of hypnotizing. Uh, just I, I just thought it was a um, f from a creative aspect. I don't know if that director will ever top that movie. But what, what, what were your thoughts on Get Out uh, looking back on it? Um, yeah, no. Um, first, never thought that I'd be scared of a, a, a teacup and a teaspoon like that in my life. Um, I forget the name of that actress, but she was really good. The the woman who played the mom, yeah. you know, she she scared scared us to death with um, a teacup and a teaspoon, you know, because every time she hits the, the the spoon to the cup, you know, he he gets knocked out and he goes back into the the well, I forget what it was called, you know, the dark space. Um, yeah, you know, um, I have to see this film again. I didn't put it in my top ten. But uh, this no, this was a really important film, and I'm glad that it was this, it was as successful as it was, and um, it was just it was just very good, uh, really well acted, but very intense, and um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what really stands out for me is is the swerve at the end. I'm not not at the end, but when when the girlfriend you know turns on. Him. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, you know, she, uh, she acts. She acts like she's trying to find the keys. Like I need those keys, and you know, it, she really plays with him. And you, I, I don't know. Like you really didn't think the girlfriend was gonna, you know, double cross him. You thought you thought their relationship was so strong that that wasn't gonna be the case. Um, I, I love the. I also love the scene where, you know, he finally realizes. You know, he, you you see all these pictures of her with all these previous, you know, black guys that she dated. You even see her with black women. Uh, the maid before the maid got transformed and uh you know when when the girl turns on him and says i can't find the keys babe it's like oh man i mean it, it was just a great swerve a great turn uh yeah i mean it, it, it is a horror movie though you know it, I, I i don't think it's gonna age i don't think it's I, I think the first time you see it you're blown away by it but um i think it might lose a little bit of luster the more you know the movie um, but yeah, man, but that's enough about Get Out. I, well, I, I thought going we want to Going off of Get Out, because my number six, because we're on number six now, my number six is Red State. Now, okay, so this is funny because I, I know a lot of people probably haven't seen Red State. And Red State did come out in the last decade, and I'm probably, you know, I think I've used the word double, the words double feature like four times this video so far. Once again, another great double feature would be Get Out with Red State. Now, I'm not going to give any credit to Kevin Smith for Get Out being successful, but I, I do find it interesting that Kevin Smith you know he he'll do these films in his career that are only somewhat successful and then another film that comes out that kind of has a similar feel ends up being a lot more successful it happened with his kind of buddy you know chummy um sophomoric jersey films with jay and silent bob and then you know some years later you had films like super bad and uh, i love you man and similar type of humor, 
you know, not exactly the same, but, you know, the, when Judd Apatow came out with his films, those, those films were huge, you know, and Kevin Smith was doing films that had a similar kind of feel, yeah. similar type of humor years earlier, and they were, you know, they weren't complete duds, but they weren't, like, mega, mega successful either. And this time around, Red State came out before Get Out, and Red State, if you haven't seen it, I totally recommend it. It's not a perfect film, but it's high on higher on my list because of the way he builds tension from the very beginning to the end. This film is like a balloon that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then just pops, you know, and um, it's really, I think it's the best you know, direction that Kevin Smith has ever done. And I think it's so, it's a shame that he couldn't continue to do that style of filmmaking. Cause I think it was like, Whoa, he's finding his niche. It is a horror movie. Um, it's very different from get out, but it reminds me of get out once again. It, well, it, yeah, the, the, sim- the similarities between the two families, I would say. Mm. Yes, exactly. You have a family in 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 this in, this, in the case of Red State, you you have a church. Right. You know, and it's based very loosely, but it's definitely inspired by the Westboro Baptists, Fred Phelps, you know, the people yeah. who would who would protest at at, you know, funerals for for gay men and women. Yeah. And so it's it's loosely inspired by by that by that guy. Yeah. Um and um, you know, if if Fred Phelps was was really that horrific, what would it be like? And so there's a feeling of being trapped, just like Get Out. Um, you know, not I being mean, able to, it definitely yeah. has like that slavery feel to it. Yeah, I mean, I, not just with blacks, but just just you know, they 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 took those three kids and had them basically yeah. tied up in uh-huh. the church. Yeah, so they yeah. They had them in cages. It's I would say it's more horrific. I think Kevin Smith blends genre more. It, he, he kind of blends comedy, horror, and action together. And yeah. I think Get it, it Out... It became more of a war movie at the end. Yeah, it's very, it kind, of, kind of, yeah. Um, it's a very short film. Yeah. But if you want to see just a really good exercise in building tension and making it explode, please see Red State. Well, well the, and, the, the, the most important about Red thing about Red State is, is the shot that it takes that religion, though. Uh-huh. What do you think about that? Mm. Well, it's not a shot just at religion. It's a shot at, you know, um, extremist religion. It's a yeah. shot at fundamentalist religion, whether regardless of, but in this case, fundamentalist Christianity. Right. But this, the, the people that inspire this are, are beyond fundamentalists. They're just a racist, homophobic, yeah. um, you know, just horrible people yeah. even you know even even the nazis um for you know it, that's what they say it's like even 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 nazis don't want to have anything to do with this guy right you know right. In, well, in michael the film. parks michael the oh. the character that michael parks well, i mean the, the, you said michael parks here let me see this all right so, so so you were telling me that michael parks was really not that well known um during his heyday but uh, in this movie though you, you you could argue that that he, he played one of the um best villains of the decade as far as you know uh out of any actor i've ever seen in any movie i think i might have hated this guy more than anybody yeah. he, it makes you hate him you know he's always he's either always fucking singing something or he's quoting the bible uh he's 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 in he's in control you know even when the sheriff came you you still felt like the sheriff was like green and you know wasn't going to do anything he, he just he just he just said oh you're a person of the law i wouldn't mess with you you know it's he's just just the way he, yeah he's always he's, in control he's always in control because he always believes in everything that he's saying because he is entitled to the, uh, the lord whatever the version of the lord is yeah. for him and and his all his his church patrons are also entitled to whatever version of the Lord that is, and the and so really, Melissa Leo is scary good in this. I mean, she's good yeah. in the, she's great in the fighter. She's great in this too. She's one of the best actresses. She's ever. in Prisoners. Too, she's right? in Prisoners yeah. too, which I know is on your list. Um, but she's um, she's good. John Goodman. 
John fucking Goodman is so good in this and right. different, different right. than you're usually used to seeing John right, Goodman. Yeah, yeah. The, well, uh, he plays the head, not the head of the FBI, but the head of uh, the police. Uh, he's not the police. I don't know if it's the it's FBI. Not the, it's not the FBI. It's not the FBI. It's some government, you know, um, you know, sector sector of the government. Yeah. I don't know enough about government agencies, but but he's definitely not some, local police. No. no, it was. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. But it's a federal. It's right, a federal no, agency. Good. Yeah, you yeah. see, you see the uh, range that. He had for him to be in a uh, sitcom like Roseanne for <laughs> all those years, and, and yeah. for him to be able to. No, but I, I know Jogerman's a good actor. Yeah, you know. Uh, all right, so Red State. You know, I know you had it on your list. I I, I just actually watched the movie. Um, the the portrayal is something everyone needs to check out about the the, the these extremists. But uh, you know, it, it's it's a very dark movie. It's not a movie I would ever go back to. But it's a movie that I think needed to be made, though. It's only eighty eight minutes. It's a very right, short very short. Thank movie. God, it's but short. It, but it you get a whole wallop from it. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. That's so. It's on my list. I think it's a very important film that a lot of people have forgotten about. All right, uh, number six, I have Creed. Yeah. I, All right, so uh, I have Creed at number six. Uh, you know, I was very excited when I saw this movie, when I saw that they were going to do this movie, because, you know, you kind of wonder, how is it going to tie into uh, Apollo Creed because he's dead? But, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the one negative about the movie for me is, you know, Carl Weathers has no involvement of it. You, you, you always, you always kind of wonder, you know, how, how could they get Carl Weathers involved in this because he was so... Um, important to the uh, Rocky franchise, but you know they, they definitely pulled it off here. You know Michael B. Jordan ended up playing uh, you know, Apollo Creed's uh, illegitimate son, and he went out to Philadelphia to train with uh, Rocky, and uh, you know wanted to make a, a name for himself without relying on the Creed name. But uh, yeah, I mean the, the the music just you know I mean the movie just told the story of um, of someone that was driven and 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 didn't want to be uh, you know classified as as a as a mistake you know I, I think i think a lot of times when uh uh you know kids grow up without a father or a father figure uh i think mentally it's it's extremely difficult on them but uh but 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 with creed um you know you, you see he really needed uh sylvester stallone and rocky as as like that father figure to, to train him and, and give him the confidence uh you know to make a name for himself so yeah i mean it was it was a great performance it was it's kind of the movie that made michael b jordan uh, a superstar you know he he had uh you know i, I didn't see fruit uh, fruitvale station but that's the movie where michael b jordan really got his foot in the door but i think creed uh really took it took it to another level and then sylvester stallone uh, the most critically acclaimed performance he's had probably since Copland or maybe even since the first Rocky. And uh, I, I think with Creed, I think he f they finally found a director uh, that knew how to direct Stallone in, in, in a more serious light. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was, you know, it, it's funny, like there's a lot of similarities with Creed and, and Rocky V. You know, cause Rocky, you know, he was kind of playing the Mickey role and it was kind of that movie is for some reason kind of gets laughed at. Um, but I think I think with Creed, this is the movie where Stallone really found his niche as being that older, you know, guy this time in Mickey's, uh, you know, kind of playing that Mickey character. And uh, yeah, man. So so Creed, the, the first Creed definitely um, would make my list. You could argue Creed 2 is a better movie, but because, uh, you know, Creed 1 created such a, a buzz uh, I got to go with Creed One. Do you have any thoughts on Creed One? Yeah, I respect that, and I respect that you that you wanted to put you know the 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 red the the first Creed over the second. I think I probably would have put the second one um, over the first one just because of the emotion. The emotion was really really good in the in the, in the second one. But um, no, I'm so happy that they you know revitalize this franchise you know with uh with this new character um i think it, I, I really like it i like rocky so I, I you know i'm a rocky fan i'll probably get a rocky tattoo someday i just fucking love the rocky saga 
Um, and yes, like you, I have guilty pleasure love for Rocky Five, uh, which you know you're not supposed to say, but I actually do think there's some good stuff about Rocky Five. Oh no, uh, Michael yeah. Rappaport. Yeah. Said it, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, good, Michael. Well, I, I love Michael Rappaport. So if he feels that way, then I feel that way. But but no, Creed and Creed Two are, are great. They don't make my list of top ten. Um, but damn, I had a great time with these films. Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, the, I, I think the one thing that was missing with Creed, you could argue, is that um, I, I just don't know if you had that villain, you know, that, that really made you yes, care. right. That was some people's complaint about it. Uh-huh. I mean, the, the Australian guy that he fought in the end, you know, he, he looked like a pretty in, intense dude. But it, it, it was really, it wasn't about the villain. It was more about, you know, Michael B. Jordan just proven to himself that he could do it, you know, and, and do it without, you know, uh, just relying on his father's name. Well, well just like uh, the original Rocky, I mean, you didn't really have a whole lot uh, to, of meat to chew on with the Apollo character until the second one. Right. Until, until the, when, when Apollo wanted, basically wanted to prove that he could knock, knock Rocky out, you know. Um, so, so I think that that's appropriate, you yeah. know, for, for that, whoever he was going to fight to not, not spend too much time on that and focus yeah. more on, on Creed and the, you know, and this, this, this character having to prove that he, he belongs in there with the big boys yeah. and, you know, that search for that, that father figure and finding that in Rocky and, uh, yeah, no, it's a beautiful story. I always got to get hooked into but, it. But, you know, when, when you look at Michael B. Jordan's character, it, it, he's, he's actually a lot more like Rocky than Apollo Creed, I think, when you look at it. Apollo? Yeah, like, he's not as, like, flamboyant and as, like, over the top with the, um, you know, dancing and the charisma or, like Apollo. Or, you, or Adonis. I think he's more, he's right. more of, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's, like, as raw as Stallone used to be right. in Rocky, where he really wasn't that talented, but he had heart. Uh-huh. You know, I, I think Michael B. Jordan's a little bit more athletic, gifted than than Rocky was. Right. But uh, no, it's just you know, sure, because he's coming from privilege. Right. So you have that. That has to play into the way he fights, the way he yeah. talks, the way he moves. But he's also coming from a place of uncertainty and wanting to prove himself. And he's had to he's had to put himself in unprivileged situations, going to box in Mexico, for right. example. Right. And then drive back to San Diego or L.A., wherever he is, and try to, you know, be, you know, and I can relate to that. I, I, I get that. I understand right, right. that. So so that played into the way he fought, the way he talked, and the way he moved. He wasn't an, uh, an underdog, working class, you know, character like no, Rocky. Yeah. You know, he fights like he has nothing to live for, you know, sort of, sort, sort of way. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. All right, why don't you get into your number five, right? My number five? Wait, what is my number five? Let me grab my, my list here. Um, oh, okay, my number five is Django Unchained. Um, so, you know, man, I love Tarantino. I don't know why I don't just put everything that he does in number one, because every time I see the film or get a chance to talk about his movies, I smile, I get a giant smile on my face. Man, come on, Django Unchained. I, I'm not going to say a lot about it. All I'm going to say is just see the damn movie. It's just so much freaking fun. Um, this it's it's got comedy, it's got revenge, it's got bloody, you know, gore, action. It it's got tragedy. It's got it's a freaking movie, man. It's got everything that you'd want in a yeah. movie, and um, it's it's just it's badass. Go please, just, if you haven't seen it, just see it. It's awesome, you know. If you if you and if you like Tarantino, you'll love it. What about Spike Lee? What well, do you think about what he said? I, you know, Spike Lee's, I don't know, he's always been, a, he's always been on Tarantino's back. He's always been yeah. a critic of, of the Tarantino thing, you know. Right, right. Um, but that's, you know, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to get into that. You know, obviously the N-word is used like a record amount of times. Oh, it is. Uh, I, I think, you know, yeah. and if it, I don't know if it's a record, it's probably close to it. Yeah. But um, great performances, man. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, I don't think he got nominated, but he should have been nominated for Best Supporting Actor in this. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson is hilarious. And um, Chris, Christoph Waltz, um, he he got nominated. He won. Right? Yeah, he won for the second Tarantino film. Yeah, you know, in a row. It, it's interesting. Yeah. He played such a different character than in Glorious Bastards. Yeah, he's more of a mentor. Yeah. He's more of a he's a friend to him. This is a fantasy film. It's a fantasy. It's, it's a it's a it's a, it's, fa- it's a fairy tale that takes place in the times of slavery 
uh, giving people, giving slaves, more black slaves, a black superhero, you know, yeah. and that didn't exist. And that's what this is, you know, basically, you, All know, right. uh, you know, if you want to sum it up. Uh, so number five, I have the Hateful Eight. Well, why don't you give oh. your take on the Hateful Eight now, and then I'll follow. Okay, up. all right. Well, so, okay, that's perfect, because that's my number four. Okay, all right. That's, uh, no, that, 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 that's perfect. Um, this film had to grow on me, okay? Yeah, all right. right. If, if, uh, if Django Unchained is like, a, is like a nice tall glass of like a really smooth pale ale, if you're a beer right. drinker, this is a freaking glass of whiskey. Well, you, okay. you just said Django is like you know, a fairy tale. This is the opposite. This is this is this is basic. This is different, man. This is a murder. This is like a mystery, you know, film that takes place. It, 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 I don't even know how to describe it. But this is my number for it. The first two times I saw the film, I was like, okay, whoa. If you're a Tarantino fan, here's a, here's a really cool thing that happens here, okay? Because in Gl Inglorious Bastards, the Kill Bill movies to an extent, and um, he's really, really, con and with Django especially, he's really concerned with pacing. You could tell he had been to see some of the Judd Apatow comedies because the way his movies flow with the yeah. comedy is actually a little bit similar. Oh, wow. So he's very concerned with that sort of pacing. It became, became very entertaining for audiences. In Hateful Eight, he said, I'm not going to focus on that as much. Yeah. I'm going to pace the movie the way I want to pace it. And because right. it's a mystery movie, um, he decides to have long, wide shots to let you really drink in those wide shots. He decides to have, he's always got long stretches of dialogue, but he really lets, gives it time. Because he's shooting it in 70 millimeter, well, 65 millimeter, projected in 70 millimeter, right. I think. Um, because he's shooting it in 65 millimeter, he's, you know, he has to have these very big, wide, grandiose shots in these very small, claustrophobic, in this location inside the haberdashery yeah. and so if you haven't seen this film i'm gonna go i'll warn you you might not like it because the pacing is is very slow and it's very methodical um it, it, it's probably you know I, I think it's one of those films it's not in my top three tarantino move but it's kind of it's become one of, in my top five and it's perfect because it's my my number four of the decade because i really respect the directing i really respect the cinematography it's so unique to me he made a very unique looking yeah. film and, and, and it's hard to do dark movies like that in the snow i, I think they 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 could be very depressing to watch but, uh -huh. but he pulled it off with the hateful eight yeah he, he really he i he he does pull it off um, but it's, you know, it's, it's very slow paced, but it, 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 it works eventually to what he's trying to do. Right. And the characters, Walton Goggins, you know, uh, plays this, you know, he's the sheriff of Red Rock. Yeah. He's one of my favorite characters. I have to be careful when I say that because he is, he was born in, in the Confederate South and he is racist. He's one of my favorite characters, not because of his racist views, but, but just because as a viewer, it's so interesting to watch him debate back and forth with the Sam Jackson character and the, and the Kurt Russell character, who right. were more union. They were more more union characters, right. and it's so interesting to watch you um, because toward the end of the film, spoiler alert, he and Sam Jackson become they have to they have to join together, you right. know, but they hate each other, you know, yeah. throughout the whole film. Right. And the device of having the Lincoln letter, you yeah, know. I mean, you know, with Goggins, I, I didn't get the, the, the hatred from him that I got from some of the other characters. Mm. So I'll, right. I'll say that. Because he still has honor. Right. You know, but his hatred, his racism is, is inbred. Right. You know, and, and some of the, the racism you hear from the other characters, especially the most hateful character, played by Jennifer Jason Leigh, that's, there's no honor in yeah. that. There's no honor in what her... Well, that, that's the key to the movie. If, if you can see Jennifer Jason Leigh as being an evil bitch, or <laughs> guess what she deserved, then I think the ending is a lot more satisfying for you. Yeah. But okay. the first time I saw it, I didn't really get it that, oh, she's so evil. Because you're used to seeing her well, get beat up the whole movie. Well, they also It's play, so hard to... Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off, but they're, they're also playing... That's important, the way she ends up dying. Yeah. You know, 
it plays into this well, idea Tim Roth sets that up. of law, right? Yeah. Tim Roth, because he's the he's a, he's playing the hangman. You know, right. he's talking about you know frontier justice yeah. versus uh, I guess in you know normal justice. I forget what he says, but yeah. you know the the idea of justice, and the idea of the law, and the idea of what's honorable. Right. The, the, he said dispassionate. You, you know, right? You know? Yeah, right. Like so, the hanging hanging must be done to someone that's has uh, is dispassionate. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know, but um, <laughs> basic, basically that, that, that's a big part of this. No, story. no, the hanging must be done with this passion. I think with that's what passion. he said. Yeah, something that's like, what he said. Yeah, something like that. It was very well, but but the, the first time you see the movie, that kind of goes over your head. But when you yeah. watch it back, yeah. This is a tall, this is a tall glass of whiskey, people. Yeah, so if you really, if you haven't well, seen Well, yeah, it, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think a lot of people like it, though. I, 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 think, oh, I think it's, it's a, a Tarantino movie that the underground fans are going to love. But I don't. It's not. It's not going to appeal to the masses like no. little blonde girls did with Kill Bill, or um, you know maybe uh, you know regular black people did with Django Unchained. Uh -huh. It's it's a it's a very it's going to have a very cult ECW type of following. I would yeah. say. Yeah. No, I, I I agree uh, absolutely. I, I remember I, I I was talking to somebody about it, and I said, yeah, well, probably one of the film guys I know. Um, and 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 he said, well, he tried to do something different. You know, if people didn't like it, it's because he tried right. to do something different. Well, I'm he glad really he did it. He almost yeah. didn't make the movie because it leaked. The uh -huh. script actually leaked. So yeah, I'm glad I he think did it. it'll end Luke. up being that film in his pantheon. Yeah. That it probably people will end up being most divided on. Yeah. You you know, oh yeah, yeah. You know because it is not for everybody. Right. And know. Sam, you know Sam Jackson's performance. I guess you could argue it was hit or miss. Mm. In retrospect, it is over the top. Yeah. But also, what else are you gonna do? You're gonna play down in a Tarantino yeah. movie where you're supposed to be blowing right. people's heads off? No. I mean, right, I, right. I, you know, he's great. I think I think there are moments where Sam Jackson is great. You know. Um, so yeah, no, that's a oh that that film. Whew, I'm, I'm getting exhausted just thinking about Hateful Eight, man. That film really. All right, so that was. Uh, all right, so what was your number? Um... Oh, oh wait, that no. was my number four. What was your number five then? Django Unchained. So your number five was Django Unchained. All right, yeah. so I'll go to. Uh, all right, so now you're, number, you're on your number four. Your number four is Hateful Eight. All right, right so my number four is actually Flight uh, with, with Denzel Washington. Yeah. Um, why don't you give your input first and then I'll kind of add it? Well, what, what, what was it about Flight? I mean, when you look back at this decade, there's there's a lot of mixed feelings about Denzel. Even some of the black reviewers have stated that you know yeah. a lot of his movies weren't haven't really been that good. I mean, do you agree with that? Well, I think I think I think in in some cases, you know, I, I think you you have to do um, like Will Farrell and um, um, oh my God, how can I forget his name? On Between Two Ferns, what's wrong with Zach Galifianakis? They there's the I don't know. I love their Between Two Ferns. Those two, Will Farrell and Zach Galifianakis, where you know Will Farrell's like. You do one for them, you do one for you. You know, right, what, right. what basically what he's saying is, well, that's you know, what he did, yeah. yeah, you do movies that you know are going to, you know, bring in the bacon, bring home yeah. the bacon and, and, and sell, which Denzel is still a very big name. So he has to, like, some movies like The Equalizer, for example, you know, people are going to go and enjoy that film and seeing him play that type of character. But then he's going to do other movies like Fences, which are really more like passion projects. Yeah. And for him to have the ability in Hollywood to do a passion project with all that money behind it, it's pretty freaking amazing. Yeah. Um, but this film, I think, is great. Um, you know, this is almost, you know, it's almost funny. It would have been great to see if they could have cast Tom Hanks in this film somewhere because this has a Tom Hanks feel to it, but it's oh, so. Oh, because of Sully? Yeah, 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 Sully, Castaway, you know, there's yeah. the, these types of films that Tom Hanks does, but but the character is definitely much better for Denzel Washington. And, yeah. and it's great to see Denzel play this role yeah. because Denzel and Tom Hanks, both those types of actors, they they're very intentional in playing characters that have this sort of code of honor. You know, they they're very intentional in playing characters. It's similar to the you know the the characters of old Hollywood. They they have to have a layer 
of honor that you said with, they don't want to just deceive you. Like some right. of Tarantino's characters are just mean sons of bitches, yeah. you know, who you end up liking anyway. Denzel doesn't want to do that. Denzel seems very intentional in playing a character who you're going to, you know, believe in and believe is, has a good nature. That's right. very important to, to, those, to those actors. Yeah, yeah. And in this movie, he has to play an alcoholic, severe alcoholic, who ends up saving people's lives because he's an extraordinary pilot. Right. And he's, he, he's a good person at his core, but he's incredibly broken. Broken right. in the sense that he is an alcoholic, and he's and right. he has he's disconnected from his son and his family, yeah. and he drags his family through hell because of his alcoholism. Right, right. The, the tension gonna, between him and his son was pretty high. I think they actually the, fought at one point in the movie. The, the scene where he goes into the the mom's house and he tries to hug the, even though the son is like basically pushing him off. He says, "I love my son. I love my son," and he's drunk and he's and he's hugging him and trying to kiss his son, yeah. smiling while his son. Is just being so disconnected from the emotion of his son. That was really well played. I've seen alcoholics um, act that way. Oh wow! Because they're so off in their own world, yeah. and they're so they're trying. They want. It's very sad. It's very yeah. sad. It almost makes you want to cry because he did that really well. He yeah. he played that character and no, that he did, yeah. really really well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, that's a great freaking movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, but 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 the the important thing to remember is he was, um, you know, him being drunk is not the reason why the plane crashed. I believe the plane did have a mechanical uh, issue, but he was still able to land it. It wasn't a, a exactly safe landing. Some people actually, I think, a couple people died. Uh -huh. uh, a lot, most people got actually hurt on it. But still, because he had alcohol, I mean, he he he, he didn't live a very great lifestyle. He was kind of out of shape. He was an alcoholic. I think he was seeing prostitutes. Yeah. So so he was smoking weed too. I mean, he 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 did not look very healthy in the movie. Um, but uh, you know, the 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 best scene in the movie is the temptation, though. You know, he he all he needed to do is stay sober so he could go to court and just get through it. And but but you know the the room that they had him in, I guess they didn't know, it, but there was like a little refrigerator in the divider of the hotel room, yeah. and it had like all this so, liquor in it, and so, it just it, it the movie really illustrates yeah. how. Uh, how alcoholics look at alcohol. So there was that was that's a great scene. That's one of the best scenes of the decade because there was no alcohol in his fridge, but the yes, the room next to him, the wind from the, the there was an open window was pushing the door. The door was unlocked, yeah. and, and the door was was opening and closing or going back and forth, and it was it was knocking and it woke him up. And he pushed through, he can get to the other room. And as soon as he got on the other side, in his brain he goes, there's probably alcohol in that fridge. And he opens the fridge, and, the, and the, there's a camera, there's a POV shot. You could see from the alcohol's perspective, the alcohol is just shining. And the refrigerator light is shining up in his face. And you think he's going to close the door. They, they show him like the, with the door closing. And it's right as the door. You think the door's going to close. He, you see his hand grab yeah. one or two of those little liquor bottles. Yeah. And then you go, no. <laughs> oh, my God. And yeah. so, then he ends up going to jail. Yeah. yeah he, he, and, then, and then John Goodman. You know, yeah, John Goodman. Yeah, he, yeah. He's in it. He plays a great cat. He basically is the guy who has to, he get, he has to wake him up. Yeah. With basically cocaine and a bunch of other now, drugs. What's the other guy? The Earl the Goat, Man of Goat. What's his name again? Oh, the, the, oh, the name of the Denzel character? No, no, no. The, uh, the other black guy in the movie, the lawyer. Oh, that, that, that gives him the cocaine. Oh, so so he so he could you know I, I guess cocaine numbs the alcohol. About, oh, you talk about Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle, yeah. yeah Don oh, Cheadle. I forgot he's good in this too. Yeah, yeah. this is a good movie. Yeah, Very, this is a good yeah, movie. Yeah. yeah, I like this movie, man. And then the movie yeah. ends with him telling stories uh, in jail. Yeah, he's in jail with yeah. his with his son. So yeah, that's great. It's uh, yeah, definitely the best Denzel movie of the decade. I, I think Denzel, you know, had a pretty good decade. Equalizer made money. He's done some experimental movies like Fences and Roman uh, J. Israel Esquire. That so, movie is not a great entertaining film, but I think a very important film. Every every person who's going to law school or is going into social work yeah. should fucking watch that movie. Right. Roman I don't think J. it made a lot yeah. of money. But Everybody who wants to get it should watch that freaking movie. But it, it kind of shows yeah. you how crooked uh, that business could be. Right? It's not just crooked. It's just <laughs> complicated and complex and chaotic. And, right. 
crazy, you know. Um, what was, does it mean to be a good person in mm. that world? Ro- Roman J. S. Uh, Israel Esquire. Yeah, that's another. That's a good honorable mention. All right. So, all right. So, why don't you give your number three? The Wolf of Wall Street. The Wolf of Wall Street. You know, I know it's not on your list. I know some people don't like it. Um, it's a wallop of a movie. Um, here's the reason why it's on my list. Not just because it's just so entertaining, but because of the ride that Scorsese and DiCaprio take you on. Um, I have to be careful because I get really emotional talking about this character, surprisingly. Um, the, the character of Jordan Belfort, you know, the true stuff about him, the stuff that they kind of, you know, maybe they exaggerated some of it. Um, you can't help as a young man and, you know, I was a younger man when I saw the film, but I'm a little older now. I'm 33. You can't help but kind of want to go on that ride of just making more money and becoming more successful and buying more cars and having all these women with you. You can't help but be like, wow, well, I, I want all those things, too, because those are the opiates of our society. Those are the things that we really want. You know, we, the, the, you know, TV and media tells us that we want in life. And so it's hard not to admire him. A lot of people admire Jordan Belfort. I have business friends, friends who are in business, who admire this guy. The real guy. The real guy. Yeah. And, they, and they watch the movie and they get motivated to go out and make sales or go back to work and, you know, whatever it is they do. But... What's beautiful about what Scorsese does and the ride that, that, that they take you on is that there comes a point in the movie where you start to go, oh, wait a second. This person, you know, is, I, I'm not this guy. I'm not this. I don't want to be like this person. And it's the, it's the scene where he's on his yacht and the FBI, you know, um, come and basically interview him, you know, and talk to him. And the scene, they go from being friendly with each other and chummy chummy to just basically hating each other because Jordan knows that the FBI is investigating him. And then he stands over the yacht and he starts throwing $100 bills over over the, the ledge of the yacht. And you say, you know what? You know, this is, I got a year's salary for you right here. You know what these are to me? They're fun coupons. <laughs> I don't know why. That scene makes me so angry. I think it makes me so angry and it makes me so sad because I think about my parents and I think about um, some of the other people I've known throughout the course of my life and myself. You know what it's like to work nine to five. You know what it's like to work for a, for a paycheck. And it, it, it's you work so hard just to be able to, you know, break even sometimes. And you have this person who is basically just throwing it in, in their faces and throwing it in your face that they have all this power with, with all this money. And that's the reason why I, I, I love this film so much because, yes, you laugh at it. It makes me laugh. It makes me cry. It makes me angry. It really plays with my emotions in a wonderful way. And I just, I love the way that they did that i was very impressed that's my number three that's 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 a damn good film wolf of wall street all right yeah all right so that's the uh wolf of wall street you know i i really love the movie well i'll, I'll be quick with this um you know it made margot robbie a, a a star yeah that's true i think you could agree with that you know it was uh you know i, I appreciate how much effort scorsese put into the movie i think it's his last movie before the irishman uh, you know, DiCaprio was great. It, it's a long movie, and um, I think the problem people have with it, I, I know Mike Francesa said it was terrible. He's like, oh, the werewolf of Wall Street, it was awful. You call like, it the werewolf of Wall Street, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, like, he, um, like you know, he, he, he got the point that he was sick, but he, he didn't think he needed to see, like, all the sex and all the... But I, I think that's what made the movie... Uh, th- that, that's what the movie needed. I think it was a little bit too over the top as far as the drug use and the sexuality. I think that was... It was probably necessary to tell the story, right? But the film is about excess. Whether right. or not the Jordan Belfort story is all about excess, you know, the film is about excess, you know, when you have this ability to use the system and sell the way you do, uh, it's it's about you know the the excess is very important. If you, if the excess isn't there, then it, Scorsese felt like he wasn't being authentic to what the story was. Right. So, you know, take oh, it or leave it. Okay. At number number three, I actually have uh, the Green Book. Um, I, I don't think you saw this I didn't movie. See this one. No. 
But, uh, you know, the, the, the <laughs> we're bringing up Mike Francesa's name a lot. I probably wouldn't have seen it if it wasn't for him. But, you know, someone was asking, it's like, hey, Mike, did you see any movies this year? What do you think is going to win the Oscar? And he, he says, oh, there's really nothing good that I saw this year. However, there's one movie that I I saw that was great. It's the best movie I've seen in years. It's, it's The Green Book. And... Um, you know, what I got from the Green Book is it just shows us how far, you know, we've come as, as far as uh, racism. Uh, basically, this guy, is he's, a, he's an amazing uh, jazz uh, musician, and he needs someone to take him into the South. He needs someone to kind of, you know, drive him around, uh, you know, because the South is obviously it's racist. It's dangerous to drive in the South. You remember Michael Jordan's father was actually killed uh, driving in the South, uh, you know, almost 20, uh, over 25 years ago. So... So, you know, he, he kind of takes this job to kind of, uh, you know, drive him around from city to city. Um, but, you know, they, they encounter a lot of racism and, and, and people trying to, you know, really mess with them. And, uh, um, and, and, and there's one scene he's actually, he actually, we actually find out that he's gay. So, um, but, you know, th this this guy is such a great musician and so well respected that he ac I think he actually made a phone call uh, to the U.S. government or, or maybe even uh, one of the president's men. And uh, he was able to get himself out of jail, even though he was wrongfully put into jail. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, that, that that's that's the thing you remember about the movie. It, it, it's it's you, you see the connection between him and the driver. It gets stronger as the movie goes on. And, uh, you know, when they eventually, when the tour is over and they drive back to the city, um, he, uh, at first he doesn't want to come celebrate Christmas Eve, but then, you know, he's, he realizes he's all by himself and the friendship, the bond they created was so strong that he actually knocks on the door as they're celebrating Christmas Eve. You have all the seafood out, all the, all the stuff, uh, out on the, on the table. And, uh, yeah. you know, he just knocks on the door and, and you could he, just, just the way he says hello to them. He's like, you could just tell they developed a, a real friendship and there was just a real understanding, um, between them. So yeah, the, the green book is definitely, um, uh, definitely one of the best movies of the decade for me. That's great. I really want to, I really want to see that. Um, I forget there's a, there's a significance to the green book. It was something that, um, blacks used in the South, right, to 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 basically kind of get around in, in in the South, you know, you know, in the time in in the early to mid twentieth century. Do you, yeah. do you remember what the significance of the the object? Why they oh why it, they called it the Green Book? Why they used I, it? I think I think it's it was um, yeah I I think that's exactly what it is. I think it's just a guide for for driving in the South. Oh okay yeah. I see. So where they could go without where, yeah where they can go yeah exactly where they, they can, can go. go where it's not segregated, where they're right. welcomed. Right, because there's so same. many times where they get they get stopped just because yeah. the guy is black. Wow. wow. And, and uh, you know, the, the most important part of the movie is, uh, I, I believe they're, um, you know, the guy is a jazz mu uh, musician, so he's allowed to play the music and everything. But, but uh, when it came to letting him eat he, or, t or go to the bathroom, he had to get in the car and, and go somewhere else to, to, to go to the bathroom. You know, and the, the nearest bathroom is like 30 minutes away. So how fucked up is that? That he's there to, you know, play for them, but they won't even let him use the bathroom or they won't even let him eat with them. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's a great portrayal of how, how far our, uh, our society has come. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. All right, so uh, what was your number uh, two? Well, I've got to see that one. So my number two, and I'm very excited to talk about this one, is, um, and my mom bought me um, this, uh, the, the DVD of this, um, so, so happy she did because I've watched it over and over again. Steve Jobs with Michael Fassbender uh, playing Steve Jobs, Kate Winslet playing his assistant, and, and Jeff Daniels, and uh, Seth Rogen in probably the role of his career. I'm not sure that enough people are talking about the way this film flows. It's 
all dialogue. I mean, it is just three acts of dialogue. And it, the great thing about it, though, is it doesn't feel like a play to me. It is a film. It could have it, it could have very easily felt like you know, when we talk about Fences, it just kind of feels the Denzel Washington movie. It just feels like a play. This does not feel like a play. And so they, they did a really good job of still making it cinematic, still making it feel like a film. It's directed by Danny Boyle. So I actually think which he's not my favorite director, but I think in, in the case of this script and this movie, it really, really works. Aaron Sorkin wrote the script, and he's one of the greatest, you know, script writers out there right now. And I just, I love the dialogue. I think the acting is, is off the charts. Um, and it takes place in three acts. 1984 is the first act, 1988, and then 1998. I don't own. I don't think I own anything Apple. The thing, the only thing I own that from that's from Apple iPod. is the iPod that my mom bought me back in what was it, two thousand six or yeah. Yeah, something like that. So I've always stayed away from Apple. So I'm not a big Apple fan. That doesn't. That doesn't has nothing to do with it. Whether you like Apple, you don't like Apple, whatever. It's, it has nothing to do with it. Um, don't. This movie is very entertaining. Aaron Sorkin did a really good job of taking a very, you know, he took a piece of journalism that was the book on Steve Jobs and he turned it into a very subjective, very emotional, very heartfelt story about Steve Jobs and his daughter and Steve Jobs and the people that he worked with and the controversial figure that Steve Jobs was. And I really hope that if you're, if you're listening to this, you go please watch Steve Jobs if you haven't seen it. It's one of my favorite films of all time now because I just every time I watch it, I go, oh my God, this is just off the charts. I, I read, they really made me care about these characters. And um, yeah, they, the, the, you just really get tapped into um, the emotion um, the anger, um, the confusion, um, and you just admire, you also admire the leadership of, of Steve Jobs and what this person had to go through. So they really, really did a good job at that. I, I love it. Steve Jobs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you haven't seen that one. No, I, have, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So at number two, I have uh, uh, Prisoners. And it, you know, I I think prisoners it did take a lot of criticism. You know, that I I think a lot of um, it took a lot of criticism because of how how you know it's basically about a mentally retarded kid getting beat up throughout a lot of the movie. And you kind of, sometimes you think about how did this even pass getting into the theaters, right? But uh, you know what I liked about the movie was uh, the tension, and uh, when you see the movie for the first time, you just you constantly say to yourself, well, what the what the hell just happened? Uh, basically, it's about you know a, a white family and a black family. They're having Thanksgiving together, and then the two daughters are just playing outside the house. And then there's like this RV parked in front of the house, and they they mysteriously disappear. And then later on, they find the RV in the woods. And uh, there's this. I guess the kid's name is Alex, right? He's like a he's like a retarded kid with glasses. He does he can't really talk. Um, but you know the the. He he just he, once in a while he just let out these clues and he says to you Jackman as he's um, leaving the police building he says uh, they didn't cry until I left them so you're like oh okay so this kid has you know the, throughout the whole movie you're wondering is this retarded kid trying to swerve everybody so that's always in the back of your your mind. Uh, but you know what I love about the movie is you know you Jackman is just so. And, and Jake Gyllenhaal, too. They're just so friggin' like um, paranoid about what happened to these kids. You know, I, I think Hugh Jackman becomes an alcoholic. And then Jake Gyllenhaal, you could just see he just he can't sleep because he's, he's thinking about what the hell happened to these kids. Yeah. Um, you know, but basically what did happen was the retarded kid brought them home uh, to the mother. And then the mother basically uh, held the kids at the house as uh, prisoners. And the the, pris the whole prisoner theme is prevalent throughout the whole story because eventually Hugh Jackman became like a prisoner uh, to the whole situation. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, hey, you know, there's even there's a, a, the whole type of swerve with the maze and the snakes. And then you, you kind of and then there's there's, uh, you know, previous people that have been captured by her are actually potential candidates as well throughout the movie. 
Remember that one kid actually goes into the house and steals like, you know, some type of clothing. Uh, you th you kind of wonder that how does he play into it? But uh, but yeah, th this is this is the kind of crap that you have to deal with in some of these red states. You know, sick and twisted people. And uh, but yeah, what what I really like about the movie is you know there's just so much. Um, the tension is great, and the first time you see it, you're just on the edge of your seat. You know about you know who's the one that's really responsible for for kidnapping these these two little girls, and um, you know eventually when you Jackman does figure it out. Yeah. What's her name again? The woman, the old woman, or the mother? Oh, Melissa Leo. Melissa Leo just you know sticks a gun up at him. Well, maybe the actress of the decade, Melissa yeah, Leo. Yeah, but uh, but you know I thought Jake Gyllenhaal stole the show though with his uh, you know his detective work. You know he really He's he good. really did. I, I, I mean what I mean you've only seen Prisoners once. I think you just saw it on uh, on video. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I think we actually took a break in between it. But uh, I so mean what I do you remember it, about? I saw it on Laserdisc. Um, no, not not actually no. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal is, is awesome. Um, the first shot I remember, um, he's like in a diner or a coffee shop, and there's a shot behind him. And I don't know how he did, he did this or how the costume designer did this, but they just, the frustration that you could just see, it's, almost, yeah. it's almost in his hair. Yeah. Like you could just see in like how black and thick um, his hair is. Is it... So the way he was able to play that in such a subtle way, I think he's one of the greatest actors. Even though I don't have one of his films on my list, I think his performances are just as good as Leo's or, or anybody else's. Uh, I think he's awesome. And I, I, yeah, Hugh Jackman is great in this. He gets Hugh Jackman gets ugly. He gets big and ugly in this film. He, he kind of allows himself to just lose it because he's a prisoner to the fact that his daughter is. Because when when you someone kidnaps your your child you become as much of a prisoner as, as they are uh, the whole situation as you said imprisons you and jake gyllenhaal has been dealing with that prison you know in his in his career in his chosen career as an investigator he is you could just see the that in his hair in his face, in his clothes, you could just see it stuck to him. And uh, I think, as 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 much as I respect, I love Hugh Jackman. I love what Hugh Jackman has done with the Wolverine character over the years, and, and right. what he's done as an as an actor. But but for me, Jake Gyllenhaal is the standout from from this. Yeah, yeah. And Melissa Leo's just the actor actress of the decade she's just ridiculously good especially for a middle-aged woman yeah to come in and do all these great all this great work you can't say enough about her so no it's not on my list but probably because movies like this don't usually make my list i i just have a different i i, I watch movies for different things but this is this is great yeah yeah man Gotta watch that one again. All right, so that's that's prisoners at uh, at number two. Like, like I said, the, the the first time I saw it, I was on the edge of my seat. I was kind of blown away by how good it was. But um, as far as replay value goes, it's not really there. I mean, to to, to watch the the mentally challenged kid get beat up like a pumpkin by uh, Hugh Jackman, it's it's, it's not it's, it's not watch. it's not fun to watch. But you know, yeah. when when you have when when someone kidnaps your daughter, you kind of sink to yeah. you know. Uh, depths that you would have never uh, expected to and um, so th that has a lot to do with it too but uh, yeah so Prisoners is uh, I got that at number two watch it I am going to watch it again though I promise um, I will watch that one again that's holy moly okay so number one for me it's got to be Drive I mean for crying out loud this was at the beginning of the decade I saw yeah. this with my old band Infinity Fall uh, up in western New York. The reason it's number one for me is, it, to me, and this is, people are not necessarily going to agree with this, but it's the, it's the most refreshing thing I've seen in a long time. Um, I hope other filmmakers look at it and study it and not necessarily imitate it, but try to get right what uh, Nicholas Wending Refn gets right in this film. And that is the way he paces it, the, the, the lack of dialogue being that he uses the lack of dialogue to his advantage. Um, 
Um, it made Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling was already growing as like this A-list star, but it, this gave Ryan Gosling kind of like an almost like an underground cred. People who are fans of film were like, "Oh, he can act too." You know, it's very artsy. Um, it's very methodical. It's it, it might seem slow paced at times, but it's uh, it's just it's just the style of it is so wonderful for me. As soon as the titles come on, you know, those pink titles with the L.A. skyline and you hear, um, I think it's a, it's a song by, uh, by a, um, an EDM electronic music artist named Kavinsky come on. It's called Nightcrawl. I just, lo I just go, oh my God, this is something else altogether. This is a movie and this is a very refreshing, very exciting, very, you know, new film that I'm about to watch. That's how I felt about it the first time I saw it. I was like, I'm about to see something really freaking good. And the acting is great. Um, Brian Cranston is so good in it. Um, Albert Brooks is really g good in it. Um, oh my God, the guy from uh, Hellboy, I'm forgetting his name. He's great. He's great in it. There's a lot of great performances. The violence builds as the, as the film goes on. And it's a really great example of a few good actors coming together with a, with a, a director who is new, still fairly new to American cinema. I think he's, I forgot, I think he's Danish. I, I could be wrong about that. He had done some other films that had made a splash over in Europe. He came to America and you could tell that he was kind of still new to LA. And so he was kind of looking around LA and what LA is and the, the, the fantasy of it, the bullshit of it, the reality of it. And he was, you know, kind of discovering LA you know, that this, this European director. And so he made this film with these mostly American actors, very good actors. And, uh, I, it's, it's like a fantasy Western love story. I, you just got to go see it. I just, you know, I'm just going to ruin it if I keep talking about it, the way they use well, the music. But this movie drive, it's, it's more, um, it, it's more about the, uh, the symbolism than the dialogue. You, you would uh, agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and you, 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 you mentioned how they, yeah. they were able to tell the Wolverine story better in this movie than they've ever done. Right. Okay. So, so I'll talk about that real quick because a lot of people are going to be like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so if you, if you read the Wolverine comics and you really know the, what the, the Wolverine character struggles with, and I don't even think this was their intention, but there's a scene in the elevator. I think it's one of the greatest scenes I've ever seen in uh, ever watching a movie. Um, where he's in the he's in the elevator with the woman. I'm forgetting the actress's name. She's so freaking good. I'm forgetting her her name right now. But um, um, he's in the scene. He's in the elevator with her and with somebody who's there to kill them. Um, and in this scene, spoiler alert, he kisses her, and then right after he kisses her, he brutally stomps a hole into this guy's head with blood sprouting everywhere. And she backs out of the elevator. He's left in it, standing over the bloody body. And she's staring at him after he's kissed her because he loves her. Yeah. He's the only w person in the world that he loves and really cares about that much. And she's looking at him. And he's, he's looking back at her. He's still aroused from killing, from the killing. She is all at once in love with him, but horrified by what he just did at the same time. And if you know the Wolverine character, um, that's it's that, you know, the berserker rage that the, the Wolverine has. That's the same thing that Wolverine has to struggle with is that he has this code of honor. He has this courage. He has this love in him. He's a good person, but he's also capable of being a monster. And right. the women that Wolverine loves end up seeing that and they don't know how to be with that, you know? Yeah. And so I thought that that was that scene. They actually, without knowing it, they tapped into that. And I said, you know, the Hugh Jackman has been trying to tap into this character for, you know, a decade and a half. And they did it in one scene, right. you know, they, they tapped into the essence of that character in one scene, you know, whether they knew it or not.
because the Wolverine character is similar to other characters we've seen in literature and westerns, you know. And so in this movie is, the, the, the director has talked about as being kind of like a modern day western, even right. though it doesn't have a western feel. Yeah. It's very, it's got some of the similar story elements that you'd find in a western, you yeah. know. And so if you haven't seen Drive, please see Drive. It, it, to me, it is... It is the film of the, 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 the 21st century so far. I haven't seen anything that can match it in terms of what it does for cinema, uh, you know, right. wow. for me. I mean, is it very highly regarded, though, Drive? Um, I, I, I know that I, I have some friends who are really who are crazy about it, who really like it. I don't think that my other like friends who are like who would consider themselves cinephiles think about it as highly as I do. But I, I think it's on that level. I, I put yeah. it there, you know, and um, Nicholas Wending Ref and his films that follow. If you like it, you should watch, you know, yeah. Only God Forgives. And then he did another movie about L.A. models, which is really those movies aren't as good because they don't they don't handle the morality as well. They're more yeah. horror movies, right, right. you know, um, so but um, they do they have a similar feel to them. But right. but this was this is a good example of a director like new to L.A. developing his fantasy elements of L.A. America, you know, and just getting the yeah. right actors and the right roles in to do this this film. And I so I, I yeah Drive is uh, the the film of the decade for me. Um, but with Ryan Gosling, I, I just want to make a point about him. I mean, you look at some of the movies he did at the beginning of the decade. And now, um, you know, and then he did a movie like La La Land. So, I mean, do, do you feel like he's transformed himself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's kind of, he's kind of, he's, I wouldn't say softened his work, but he, he's, yeah. he's, I mean, he, he's, you would say he's kind of went away from those dark characters. He's now doing he's, a lot. He's, he's working with, he's doing everything. He's yeah. working with a lot of big time directors um, and he's, he's doing a lot of different types of films and I don't know. I like Ryan Gosling. I don't think he's the greatest actor. Obviously women are crazy about him and I can see why. I mean, it's hard not to have a freaking, I'm, I'm a straight man, but I'm comfortable enough to say that's a good looking man right there. I, I don't mind saying it. He, he really is a good looking dude. Um, but that has a lot to do with his success, I'm sure. But he's also, no, he's a damn, he's a good actor who's working with really good directors and right. really, really so, good So you like talented. his choice of directors better I like, than Jake Gyllenhaal? Yeah, his choice to do Drive and then his choice to do the movie A Place Beyond the Pines, which yeah. I forget the name of that director, but he, he was also in a, in a movie with that director, a movie I didn't like as much called Blue Valentine. Right. Um, I just think that he's he chose very early on in the decade he chose some really good directors to work with and so he's had some great roles. He was also in a movie honorable mention for me, Nice Guys with uh, with with Russell Crowe, which I it, it, it I just bumped it off in my top 10. It's probably my number 11. One of the funniest movies I've seen. It's like Rush Hour meets Lethal Weapon. It's, it was directed by the same guy, right. um, Shane Black, who wrote the Lethal Weapon movies. Yeah. He wrote those movies. Um, and, you know, that's not for everybody, but it was so funny. And it flowed so well. And it was so much fun. So that Nice Guys is another Ryan Gosling movie. Like, he just keeps doing movies that are like... Is he the greatest actor? No, but he can do a lot of, he has a pretty good range. He can do a lot of different types of movies. He work with a lot of different directors. He's working with the right people. He's, he must have a good agent, I'm sure. Okay, all right, so let's wrap it up. Uh, my number one is actually Silver Linings Playbook. Um, so why do I have this at number one? Um, well, you know, the, the movie is definitely about mental health. I, I, I just think I'm attracted to the movie because you have a couple, you know, Jennifer Lawrence and... Uh, What's his name? Bradley Cooper. They kind of uh, fall in love at the end of the movie. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a very complicated uh, story about uh, you know Bradley Cooper's actually married and uh, you know his, his wife actually cheats on him and then he he was going for he help um, and and then Jennifer Lawrence is kind of uh, she's going through a transitional time as well. Uh, I think she had just gotten fired from her job. So, you know, I, I, I'm really attracted to the movie because there's two people that, you know, I guess you could argue is a very good looking couple that's basically struggling in life and they found each other uh, at the end of the movie. 
But, uh, you know, I, I just think the movie has a great list of characters from Chris Tucker and then Robert De Niro is, plays the father. He's very, like, um, what would you say? He's, he's, like, obsessed with sports. He's very, uh, you know... But, you know, Silver Lines Playbook to me, uh, the, the, the story is really about Jennifer Lawrence. You know, she, she really, um, I think this is going to be a very difficult movie for her to top. She re I, I, I think she, she comes away from this uh, movie really, you know, you just really connect with her here. Um, so Silver Lines Playbook to me, this is, uh, I, I would say, definitely my um, uh, favorite movie of the decade. And. I I think I think the reason I like it the most is because of what uh, De Niro says at the end of the movie. He, he basically says, you know, it, it's a it's a sin if you walk away now because he could tell that Jennifer Lawrence really loves him at the end of the dance contest, and and, she, and he he basically says, you know, I don't know if your wife ever loved you, but but I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I know I know that girl loves you right now. If you don't reach back, that's a sin. So that's something that obviously I've always um, connected with. Um, so, you know, that's probably the main reason why I think it's uh, the movie of the decade. But well, like I said, it's, it's a great cast. Uh, I, I think Bradley Cooper's character, it's a lot of fun. It's over the top. It's, it's kind of weird. But, uh, you know, Jennifer Lawrence, to me, you know, I, I just I really love it. I mean, it, it's a rare case where you have a girl that's beautiful. But at the same time, like her personality wise, she knocks it out of the park as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, what, what do you, uh, looking back at Silver Lines Playbook, you have anything to add about it? Oh, all I can say is David O. Russell, I mean, my, the, I, was, I had to choose one of his films. I chose The Fighter, you know, oh, right. to round out my list. Um, but I, um, this, this is great too. This is, I don't know, this is definitely one of my honorable mentions. The actors are great. Um, uh, you know, the acting is wonderful. And, um, I mean, she won the Oscar for that, for this. And, um, I want to cry at the end of the movie every time. It's just a sweet, you know what it is? To me, it's a sweet slice of life movie. Um, and it's another family melodrama. David O. Russell's really good at the fa at families and, and how families interact. He's really good with that. Right. And With the um, whole superstitious De Niro, that's what I was trying to say. De Niro's very superstitious. Mm -hmm. I thought that gave the movie like an extra layer. And I liked how Jennifer Lawrence kind of used that to her advantage. Yeah. As the movie progressed, it it could very you know it, in the hands of a different director, this could very easily just be seen as like a goofball comedy movie. But because but the way David O. Russell is able to balance comedy and drama really well, it, it makes this movie mean so much more to the people who watch it and people, yeah. especially you know his son has bipolar. And, um, and, and, and of course, the Bradley Cooper character is bipolar. bipolar yeah. And so this was very near and dear to him, you know, to make this, this movie with this character. And, yeah. and so he, yeah, no, it's a, David O. Russell's, I haven't seen his stuff recently. But what do you think of the, the first set of dialogue between Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence when they first met? It was, it was so unorthodox. It's a very right? awkward. Very awkward. Yeah, but yeah. they pulled it off, though. They, right? they did, yeah. yeah. No, they, they they pulled off, and you you've talked about the diner scene before. Yeah, the, the diner the cool. diner scene is where she she fucking loses it. She's great. She was so young yeah. too, but she looks. See, and, and, and the film she does, and, it's almost like she's five years old. And Debbie watched yeah, that scene, great. and she thought it was weird that I liked it because she's so like crazy. But it, I don't know. I, I just it, that that's not an easy scene to pull off. Right. You know, I mean, she basically overreacted. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I don't think she. I don't think she overreacted. I think she a button was pushed. Yeah. She has her own mental health issues. Uh, her husband died, and she doesn't know how to cope with it. And she's she's coping with it by you know by sleeping around, by being with other you know women men, and that, and right. people do that in real right. life. So it's yeah. it's a very real thing. And um, she's looking for a connection, you know, with him that's very real. Um, but they end up being able to relate to each other. And yeah. oftentimes that will happen in life where people who have me mental illness end up being in relationships with other people who also have mental illness, you know, to, to some degree. Because it's, you know, they end up find people end up finding each other because, right. of, because of those things. They can relate. They, they get it. They understand. And um, so, so, yeah. 
um it's uh it's it's crazy you know but but it's but it's a it's beautiful it's kind of it's a beautiful movie man yeah it makes me want to cry um but um can i give some honorable mentions before yeah we sure yeah why don't you wrap yeah. it up wrap up the video yeah um and if you have any honorable mentions, no, please. I don't have any. So, Nice Guys was my first honorable mention. I talked about that. Also, The American, I didn't even realize. The, the American with George Clooney came out in 2010. A lot of people who see it don't like it. I like it. Another very slow-paced movie if you're a fan of film and you want to see some amazing, I, what, amazing cinematography and the way that they use um, long, wide shots. Please see The American. I actually really, I like it. It's not a great film, but it's a very good film. Uh, long stretches without dialogue. Um, and a George Clooney character that you're not used to seeing. A different type of George Clooney that you don't typically see. Um, Days of Future Past. I'm an X-Men fan. I, I like the, the newer X-Men movies, man. I don't care. I actually enjoyed Dark Phoenix. I probably had my, my X-Men childhood goggles on. But Days of Future Past is the quintessential X-Men movie. I think a lot of people would agree with that. That, to me, is the best X-Men film that's ever been done. You know, um, the special effects are fine. The technology is at a place where the special effects look as good as they can look. The character work is great. McAvoy as as Xavier and Fassbender as Magneto. I I would watch those guys play those roles for the rest of my life and be happy as a pig and you know what. I absolutely love that casting and to be able to bring the old cast back to mix with the new cast in the unique way that they did it. That's the best X-Men film ever. But because it's still a superhero movie where it throws you all over the place like a lot of superhero movies do, it's not going to make my top 10 list because a good film shouldn't do that. But it's still the best freaking X-Men fan, X-Men film I've ever seen. Um, Tusk, another Kevin Smith movie that came after Red State. I don't think it was as good as Red State. I've only seen it once, but it's actually really really fun to watch and there's a cameo in it by a very famous a-list actor that they don't credit for some reason Who was it? so it's johnny depp actually oh, okay. yeah so i didn't want to give that away because it's kind of fun to be like is that johnny depp no wait that's not johnny depp oh no wait it's johnny depp so tusk is another uh, good one uh kind of loosely inspired by human centipede so if you're grossed out by movies like that then don't watch it and then another movie very important film that probably bothered a lot of people i don't think it, it didn't do very well was um joseph gordon levitt's don john you know and every um it's not a movie that you're gonna want to take your girlfriend to see it's not a movie you're wanna gonna you're gonna want to go see with your boyfriend it's probably just a movie you should watch by yourself and just think about it that's all i'm gonna say Don John, um, not a great film, but great performance by Julianne Moore. And I really respect uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt by for tackling a movie like that because it's not a movie that, because it, it's basically, it's a comedy date movie that makes men and women think about each other, think about themselves in a very real, vulnerable and you know, I would say some in some way shameful way that, you know, that's not going to make people walk out of the theater and drive home being all, you know, happy and giggly, you know, and that's, you know, that's a difficult movie to make to have be successful. So Don John's another one of my honorable mentions. Please see Don John, you know, at some point. All right, thanks for watching, everyone, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, video. Hopefully, it's not too long. What do you think? It's like an hour and a half? That was a long one. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 don't, we pull no punches, but uh, Happy New Year!